Father, the final topic I think we really should touch on is the Cassius Giacom thesis, which is, I think, a really, I think, a wonderful, sophisticated, theologically elegant um, analysis of the situation. A criticism of it is it's an innovation. It was created out of whole cloth. And um, who is Bishop Gerard de Laurier to, to, to have the arrogance to come up with this thing? And so, Father... Um, I think maybe also tying it to theology because theology is, is part and parcel of it. But let's talk about the thesis in history and history and how theologians have worked in the past. Yes. Uh, yes, this is, a, this is a big one. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the short answer is that far from being pulled out of thin air or invented by a nobody, the thesis of Cassiciacum or, or Cassiciacum or uh, the material formal thesis that's, that's known by a couple of different labels was very firmly based upon theological principles which you can find throughout uh, the works of pre-Vatican II theologians going back many centuries. In other words, those principles were always there and were drawn out progressively by theologians down the centuries. And all of these principles were put together and applied to the current situation in the church by a man who was himself very learned uh, in theology and was in fact, uh, he's, he's reputed to have been a theological advisor of Pius XII on the definition of the dogma of the Assumption. Hmm. So he was definitely not a nobody pre-Vatican II, we're talking about, uh, in uh, the church prior to the council. He was definitely somebody in the in the world of theology, we would say that, to say the least, he was somebody. So it was definitely not pulled out of thin air. It was definitely not invented by a nobody. And it is definitely not, as we said before, without historical precedent. There are, and by precedent, uh, I mean that there are examples of these very principles being applied, even by pre Vatican II uh, theologians, to situations that occurred before Vatican II. Uh, and this I came across a couple of years ago, which was then worked into material that we're uh, putting out currently on our on our developing thesis website. Uh, the case of Pope Victor the Third, and we had Father Disposito some time ago made a short video uh, explaining this case, uh, exactly how it proves the thesis, how it is a case in point, and uh, there were some objections made to it. Uh, the, I'll say the objections do not hold water, to say the least. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the, the bottom line is that uh, we have here, in the case of Pope Victor III, uh, he was someone who was elected in the year 1086, who refused to accept the papacy. And then even after being brought to Rome forcibly <laughs> to try to, uh, to get him to accept it, he, he stayed there for a few days, then left again, went back to Monte Cassino where he was from, the famous Benedictine Abbey. And then only a year later was finally prevailed upon to accept the papacy. He, didn't, he died shortly thereafter, but he finally became Pope. Uh, exactly there, according to those dates, in the following year, 1087, the year after his election. And he was exactly that, Pope-elect, for almost a year. Uh, there was no new election that happened. And the reason was that there was no need for it, that he, exactly that, as you're putting up on the screen there, had refused to accept the function of the papacy. Of course, in our times, the, the, uh, the, the nature of the refusal is different. In the case of Pope Victor III, you have someone who was a Catholic. There was no problem with his becoming Pope. But he refused to accept it. Just, I will not have anything to do with this. I am not going to accept the office of the papacy. In our times, we have somebody who is, or many different claimants, who are refusing to accept the papacy, saying by their actions, not by their words, by their actions, by their day-to-day -day imposition, attempted imposition, upon the, the entire Catholic Church of a false religion that can only lead souls to hell. Somebody who intends that does not and could not possibly intend to carry out the functions of the papacy. That is the nature of the refusal today. But that is the problem. They place that right voluntary obstacle in the way of their receiving papal authority. With regard to um, people feel uneasy that this idea of multiple pope elects one after the other, they don't like that feeling. 
um, it, it, it upsets them to some degree and, and, and they feel like, oh, this is, you know, it just feels so uncomfortable. It doesn't sit right with me. But the theology checks out from, 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 from what you're saying. Most definitely, yes. Uh, but as far as feeling uneasy about it, arguably nobody felt more uneasy about the situation than Bishop Gerard himself, who said of Poitiva, of JP2, that it burns my lips to say this of him. He recognized, obviously, how horrible this man was. Um, but he said that his, it burned his lips to have to say this, but also said that it doesn't change the fact that it's true. Uh, truth, in other words, is not <laughs> determined by its relation to error. We cannot see an error and go to the opposite extreme, imagining that that's the truth. That is not how it works. That is how many heresies have sprung up in the history of the church, by extreme reaction to another heresy. So we cannot say that, oh, well, our cor the correct reaction to Vatican II, uh, to, the, to the Vatican II religion, to the Novus Ordo, insisting that these people are popes materially and formally is to say, go to the opposite extreme and say that they are nothing, that they are popes neither materially nor formally. We have to acknowledge the truth, which is that these people have the designation, they have the election to the papacy, which they are refusing to accept. And as much as that might bother us to have to say that, it's true. <laughs> and the fact of the matter is that whether we like it or not, the truth exists. <laughs> Uh, we, we must not do what we, we refer to all the time as outcome-oriented theology. That is extremely dangerous. <laughs> oh, it just leads God. straight to error. We cannot start with our conclusion and work backwards and uh, try to line up everything to fit that conclusion. That goes by different names, uh, starting with an a priori conclusion. Some call it confirmation bias. Uh, call it what you will. It's starting with a predetermined conclusion and working backwards to try to support that. That's how you make terrible, terrible mistakes. So yes, uh, I hate to have to acknowledge the reality of the situation myself. I would love to see a normal situation in the church, but I cannot, because of that, refuse to acknowledge the situation as it is in fact. Now, right. Bishop Brown himself was the first to say that it burned his lips to say it, right. to acknowledge <laughs> the reality of the situation. Very well put forward. We recognize it, we must. Right. And that well, remains unchanged.